Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Coach Wildman, and uh, I welcome everyone to the Bonneville Canada 2022 Nationals. Um, today we have some uh, special guests with us, uh, our national team head coach, Shannon Windsor, and our captain, Jen Cross. So thanks for, having, thanks for being here with us, guys. You're welcome. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys, you can all stop walking and come and listen. Our national team coach would love your attention, so uh, over the next 15, 20 minutes, uh, we'll just be asking questions. If any athletes out there would like to ask a question, okay, feel free to come on up and uh, grab the microphone. Um, so uh, we'll start with the first question. Uh, with your experience in coaching the Canadian national team and Australian national team, what are the biggest difference between the programs? Um, I think the biggest difference are events like this. The number of kids and young people playing volleyball and playing volleyball at a, at a decent level, I think our, our clubs do a really good job in Canada, and that's a big difference than in Australia, where it's still very much like the poor sister sport um, to netball and AFL and basketball, so we, the participation is not nearly as high as it is in Canada. That's a big one. Um, also, between national teams, um, all of the athletes in the women's national team play professionally. All 32 of them, I think it is, they all play in leagues in Europe and Asia, whereas the Australian national team, we have five or six. So in Canada, we're dealing with high-level professional athletes every single day, and with that, that impacts your interactions, what you can expect from them, what they deliver, what they expect from themselves. So on a whole, it's just a, a much more professional environment here than what I would say I was uh, coaching in Australia. So you have your hand in the cricket jar on the NEP program in Richmond. I know that's a, a new, newish program to volleyball Canada. Uh, these athletes are obviously aspiring to be a part of that program and, and things beyond that. Can you speak about what the NEP program is, what it entails, uh, how you get more information on it, how to, get, how to be a part of it? Sure. Um, the National Actions Program is like my baby. Um, it's a great program. It's a program for athletes who are going into grade 11 and 12. And it's really for the athletes who are what we see as the highest priority athletes in Canada. So the top athletes from across Canada, we bring into Richmond. They train full time as part of a, a high performance program. They work with senior national team staff. And it's really about identifying who we think is going to be that has the highest potential to make an impact for Canada over the next 8 to 12 years and then us dedicating those resources or allocating the, those resources to um, the, the highest priority athletes. It's not meant to replace anything the provinces are doing or anything the clubs are doing. We want everyone to continue to do as much as they are. We're really just to supplement what's happening in the provinces, supplement what's happening to the clubs, and you know, give them uh, some technical and tactical line with the senior national team, but also give them some higher level uh, competition experience. All the NEP athletes compete against local universities and colleges um, and you know we're working with them as as the next generation or the next next generation of Canadian national team players. And, and what, what years or what months is that run? Is that like 12 months a year or is that like a, a during school, during summer? How does it work? We, we, we run it during September and December. We do it so that we don't collide with um, club season. I know that's Ontario is a little bit different but for the other provinces uh, we do it to basically replace their school year or their school um, volleyball so that they can go back and play club from, from January. So we run it from September to December. Our identification is January to March. Um, and we, you know, we're back to doing in-person trials across the country. So we had to go virtual for a year or so, but now we're back to in-person trials. And the recent group of national excellence programs, have all, uh, athletes have all been selected. I think it's been named publicly as well. So we have another 18 starting in September. Right on. So what is your coaching philosophy when it comes to coaching national level athletes? Sorry, you got, she was talking to me. She was interrupting me. Sorry about that. <laughs> What's your coaching philosophy when it comes to coaching national level athletes? Um, I mean, Any philosophy is, is a really big word. Um, for me, it's just, it has to, it's probably a series of statements that align with my personal values um, or my core values. And for me, it's really quite simple. Um, you've got to do the things that you say you're going to do. Um, I'm going to be honest whether you, you like it or not. And the biggest one is you've got to care about athletes. Athletes are people. And not only do you have to care about them, but you have to show that you care about them. And your actions need to align with that. 
I think too often we think that athletes are different to everybody else, and yeah, they, they have these this higher level of skill and talent, but the reality is they're people, and if you can treat them as people first, you're gonna to struggle to work with them. So for me, it's, yeah, be accountable, do the things you say you're gonna do, care, show you care, and be honest. Don't be afraid to have the uncomfortable, difficult conversations. Those are a series of statements I try and live by as a coach. Jen, I got a question for you. Um, can you, all these athletes are obviously aspiring to play at the highest level. Uh, can you tell them a little bit about your journey, where you started, how you, you know, got to where you are right now as the captain? Yeah, so I started playing club volleyball at 14 U, like a lot of girls here. And um, I was actually identified really early on by the national team back when we had a youth program. So I joined the national team at a youth level uh, when I was 16 and kind of was in the pipeline from that point on, which is awesome that we have the net program now because as an athlete, I would have loved that. Like that would have been right up my alley and such a great opportunity. So I, I played club and then I uh, went to the University of Michigan on a scholarship there and I, I loved every moment of it. Um, and then I've been playing pro ever since and haven't left the national team ever since. So I've been on the team full time uh, basically since 2010. So I've been here a long time. Um, but yeah, like programs like NEP and having being able to have international experience, like I would have loved that growing up because that's something that a lot of other countries in Europe that we're trying to compete against and beat, they're playing internationally starting from 16. And that's something that as a program we just haven't been able to do up to this point. So that's a, a really big stepping stone that I think we've taken as a program. But yeah, that's a little bit of my story. So is there any shout outs to a specific club here that you might have played for? Uh, Durham Attack. Uh, we were five time national champion, so go us. And I also, I won an adult national championship too, so not to toot my own horn or anything, but that was pretty fun. So everyone who is watching, they're probably going to want to know what's going on here. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you've been playing this long, like injuries happen, so I'm also getting up there in years, so I just got to take care of the little Bob. So as the captain of the national team, there has been, uh, a variety of coaches changes over the like last five six years. How do you manage that with the athletes and your 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 your, um, your teammates? Yeah, I think it's something like coaching changes can be really difficult if you don't manage it well. But I think something that bonds all the athletes is together is why we do it. Why do we play national team? Why do we sac make the sacrifices we make? And when everyone has that in mind, we can kind of weather the storm of, of coaching changes or things that might happen that we don't have control over. And, you know, as a program, like our goal is to qualify the women's team for the Olympics. And that makes, if you have that goal in mind every single day, that makes the changes and the struggles that we go through worth it. And so making sure as a unit, as a collective team, that we remind each other of that and, and be accountable to each other, I think uh, that really helps weather all those storms. So as an athlete, uh, as a national team player, any words of advice for the athletes here on their specific journey to try to play at whatever level uh, they're trying to pursue? Um, I, I know every player is different and every, every, every journey is different, but uh, any words of advice? Yeah, for me, I, I would say do not specialize too early. I don't know what the current thought process is about that, but that's rough on any feathers. But to me, like, play as much as much sports as you can, whether that's volleyball, whether that's soccer, like whatever keeps volleyball or any other sport fun for as long as possible. Because as someone who does it as a job now, you know, it's, it's always that line of like, okay, this is my job and, and I'm doing this as my profession and sometimes the fun can be taken out of it. And, and we want athletes who are thriving, not just surviving. And, and so that's something that I want all athletes to enjoy their sport forever. I want it to be a lifelong thing. Um, I also would recommend just being uh, teachable. Like you can learn something from every single coach or any single camp that you go to. If you can pick up one thing and be able to adapt under the circumstances that you're in, I think you'll be successful in the long term. Right on, Jenna. I mean, I agree with Jen. Um, I, you don't need to uh, specialize too soon. I think everyone's Path is a little bit different. Play every sport you can: basketball, softball, soccer, volleyball, everything. Whether you play four or five sports and then 
it doesn't dictate whether you're going to play for the national team. Like, enjoy it, have fun. The longer you can stay in the sport, the better for us, the better for you. Um, the other thing is, for those of you whose coaches just stick you in the middle because you're big and tall, get out of that. Demand reps at training, demand reps for passing, setting, go play beach volleyball in the summer. But that's where we need to be better as coaches. And that's where we need to be. Um, we need to be better with our bigger athletes because we're shoving them in the middle and they're not playing a lot of volleyball. So I say for those athletes, push for more reps, push for getting out of the middle, go play some beach. But we specialize way too soon, and we think that's going to help us at the higher levels. That's exactly uh, counterintuitive. It's it's, it's, the, it's different to what we actually want to see happen. Yeah, totally. I agree with the beach aspect. Like as an athlete myself, I. I dabbled in beach and the beach national team for a little bit when I was younger, but I feel like that made a world of difference just like in my ball control, and my setting ability and being able to dig and like, yes, I am a middle, but I also strive to be an all around good volleyball player. So like, don't, like middle should be doing just as many defensive reps as full of barrels ideally, you know? Like we want them getting just as many touches as everyone else. Yeah, and you say every single person on our team, regardless of the position they play, they have to be trained, like our middles don't have to be trained in defense, setting, serving. There's no there's no one person on our team that can just attack or just block. There's no such thing at the international level. You have to be an all around player. So when you if you aspire to be an international level player or a national team level player, you've got to be able to do all those skills. And as coaches we need to remember that. Those big girls in the middle who are making stay in the middle, those are our future left sides. So how can we be better at working with those athletes? So Jen, during your off season, I know we touched on this yesterday with Doug Reimer. Is there anything that you try to stay away from? Like Sarah Pavin talks about, she doesn't touch a volleyball for four months after the beach season, you know. Uh, but is there even an off season for you? Yeah. So my off season is about four days long, not uh, not four months. So like as an indoor athlete, it's it's a little bit different if you're on the national team. You you basically are playing 365, and that's just something that. As a national team program, we try to manage really well. They do a really good job of managing our load when we come into the national team because there is no bridge. And so that just means that as an athlete, you need to take a really good job of yourself physically and mentally because burnout is real and it happens. And as someone, I've, I've literally just come off of my pro season and I'm fully back into the national team. So what strategies, what coping mechanisms do I possess to help make sure that I maintain a good level of mental health and it's so critical for indoor athletes and something I think we can get better at as a program and just in general. And you brought up a really good point there about mental health. It's uh, obviously something that's on the forefront that we pay more attention to these days. How does the national team manage this with coaches and, and you guys can both touch on it uh, and athletes? I mean, I think we have to remember as athletes, they are people, so they represent a cross-section of the general population. So the rates of mental illness or mental health concerns around depression, anxiety, all of those things are present with athletes as well. So when dealing with athletes, we treat them just like we would people. Um, we make resources available to them. We have a clinical counselor who works with us as well as a mental performance coach. And if they need additional services, we'll help them connect the dots. I think the most important thing as a coach is number one to, to realize these are people and um, that is a, and how we manage them mentally, emotionally, physically matters. But as a coach, we have to lead by example and we have to look after ourselves first. And the other thing is like, we've got to show our own vulnerabilities. We've got to show where we struggle. We've got to talk about our own struggles. Only if we lead by example will others follow. And I think that you know, with our women's national team, we want to create an, create an environment where they see us as humans as well. And we create an environment where they feel confident enough to share where they're at mentally, physically, emotionally, so that we can give them the, help them with the resources they need to be their best. Because only if we're looking after the whole can we actually see them perform at the highest level consistently for a long period of time. When we focus on just the performance side, just what you guys see when we play tonight, if we only focus on that and only focus on the statistics, we would, we would get nowhere. We would have a huge turnover of athletes, um, and, and that would be a problem. The way I coach, I never want to be someone's, well, actually, I've seen a lot of times you are someone's last coach, but I, I never want the career to end early because of how we manage them or what we did or didn't do. And so I think as, as a program, it's important that we are, we show that side of ourselves. 
Yeah, and as an athlete, I think we've gotten better at, at as we've gone in the program of um, just being open and honest with each other. And the great thing is that there's like 32 of us all going through this really special but very difficult experience. And so I think we've done a really good job of checking in on each other and being open. Like I've been open about my mental health struggles with my teammates and they know where I'm at and, and can identify when I might need a little bit extra help. And that's something that I don't think we always have in the program, but I'm super proud that we're at that level that it's not hidden. It's not some secret thing that um, people are afraid to talk about. And I know if I go to Shannon with a mental health issue, she's not going to judge me or my playing time's not going to be affected and she's not going to look at me any differently than she would before I, you know, told her. And then having that safe space to be able to, whether it's Shannon, whether it's our mental health professionals that we have on staff, I know that it's a safe space that I will not be judged or looked at differently regardless of what's going on with my health mentally. And if Shannon wants the most out of me as a, as a physical athlete, that she knows that she needs to be able to support me being the best mentally as well. I think Dave, that comes back to too, the, the core values as a coach. We can talk about, I hear a lot of coaches throw around words like accountability, team first, people first, but our actions really need to align with that. And I think there's this piece where coaches need to evaluate are their actions really aligned with those values. If we say we care about athletes and we care about them as people first, are our de decisions really aligning with that? And if our actions or our decisions are not aligned with that, then we need to reevaluate. Because we can say as much as we want, I care about you. But if I don't show I care about Jen, she's never going to feel it and she's never going to feel like there's a safe space. And it's not about putting my arm around her, it's making sure, like, if she's telling me something that, um, that she needs to confide in me, it's not going to impact the decisions I make, it's not going to impact how I treat her. Um, and so you have to just have this greater self awareness as a coach, um, lining up your values with your actions. And I think a lot of that too from the athlete side is feeling that trust from your your staff, that they have your back regardless and making sure as a coach or support staff that you're establishing legitimate, honest, truthful trust with your athletes, that it's not just for show. You're not just patting me on the back and like telling me to like, I'm here for you. Like, what does that actually mean? Like what actual, actual steps are you doing to show me that you have my back just like I have yours? And let's, let's be straight, we get it wrong. As coaches, we totally get it wrong. We get it wrong a lot. But am I going to continually get it wrong, or I'm going to get it wrong, evaluate, change what I do, improve what I do, and get it right next time? That's the important thing. We're not here to be perfect as coaches, trust me. We are far from perfect. We're humans as well. Players make mistakes, coaches make mistakes. Players can do things better, coaches can do things better. But if we sit up here on this pedestal thinking we're perfect and thinking we're never going to make mistakes, we'll never get better. So I think there's this whole piece of asking for feedback, receiving feedback, and making changes. And hopefully the mistakes I make this year, and I'll make them, I don't make the same mistakes I made last year. And that's all my job is. Coach Canada, do you have a question? Oh, goodness. You always have one, come on. <laughs> um, so, Jen, uh, what are some changes that you are trying to implement to Volleyball Canada and the national team program? I know the next gen. Uh, loaded question, but open I mean, I mean, this is a huge question. I think there's some systematic things we're trying to make. Like, as a program, we want to identify athletes a lot earlier. We want to um, work with them a lot earlier. We want our whole program from youth, junior, net, next gen, senior, to all be aligned technically and tactically. We want to improve coach development, which is a, a huge piece of work that we have barely even scratched the surface on. Um, there's a whole piece here that is outside of what you're going to see the senior national team do tonight. And I think we have a lot of great people doing a lot of work in this space. So how can we work with athletes early enough? And we used to just work with them at youth and junior level, and then they go to college and university, and we kind of hope and pray they show back up in our gym. We had no idea what they were doing. We had no idea what, they were, what schools they were going to. We weren't involved in the recruitment process. And then whatever they showed up at 22 is what we got. That's no longer going to happen. We are identifying them earlier, working with them earlier, we're a resource to them when they're identifying their schools, we're talking to them, we're involved in the conversation, um, and then we're tracking their development from 16 all the way up until they're in our gym. We, we, keep a, we keep an eye on a lot of athletes. So that's from the program perspective. You got something to add, Yeah, I do have something to add, always. Uh, also, one 
something that I would love to see happen, and I want to be part of that, is keeping athletes on the national team longer. And I think that's an issue that a lot of female national teams have, is, is how to extend the careers of female athletes. And whether that's leaving because they want to go off and get married and have babies, and you know, all of that has merit, but if they're choosing to retire because they physically can't do it, or they're burnt out, or all those other reasons people retire, I think there's a lot of athletes that we can keep in longer. And I agree. And that comes from like, how are we supporting those older athletes, like into their 30s, into the later part of their 20s? Because as a program, we really haven't had many athletes past that point. And I think that's something that, if we, as Shannon said, talking about building the, the from 16 you onward, those athletes have so much value in, in helping create that program dynamic, whether that's mentoring younger athletes or just holding the standards that we have as a program. Um, what supports can we put in place to extend the longevity of, of our athletes? Yeah, and that's and part of the piece that we're working on to do just that is we obviously always need more, more resources, but we work with Game Plan as well to help these athletes identify how they can continue to work towards their next career. And by working towards their next career, we are gonna keep them in the team a little bit longer. Um, but also, how then do we support the, we don't currently have any athletes uh, who have children in the national team. Well, I would like a future where in the next five, 10 years, we have, we have national team athletes who have children who are still playing the national team. And that's an aspiration for the program. So there's a lot going on as a program whole. From the senior national team and how we play, um, some changes are happening there as well. I, I think the women's game is a, a step behind the men's game. And there's a lot we can take from the men's game. The women's game is getting faster and faster. We want to be on that page. We want to be running faster and faster. The women's game is going to you know, five attacking zones. We want to be there. And we want to be running that, those backcourt attacking zones in first or second tempo. Okay, we know that our system, we want to be playing high and inside. So these are all changes. How we teach passing, these are all changes that we're, we're adapting to in the women's national team that will trickle down to our you know, junior youth and, and national excellence programs. Yeah, and I, I think our biggest issue across Canada is that we have many different uh, rules and regulations in each province, and then we come to nationals and there's another set of rules. So if, if implementing in the U.S. and there's different rules for club kids down there. So would there be anything you would like to see changed uh, in the rules for, let's say, a U15 female athlete? Um, is it put a libero I mean, in, not a libero? You, you know, like the assumption I know what the rules are for U15 programs. I have no idea what the rules are. And to be honest, I don't think it matters. If there's one change I would love to see everybody make from across Canada, it would be pass a live serve. Pass a live serve at practice. Okay, I often walk into young people's gyms and I see us learning to pass off a chip or a toss from a coach because we want the drill to work or we want the drill to look good. And I, I think as coaches, we can we can change our practices or add you know, a coach entering a ball as a secondary event to improve that quality of that first contact. So we want to make sure that everyone's passing a live serve at practice. And if we did that from 13 years up, then we would be a better passing nation at this stage. Okay? And, I, and I say this, and I don't say this lightly, I truly believe if everyone in their gym left today and entered a live serve and had their passers pass up a live serve, it would impact us as passers at the senior level in the next four to eight years. And for you, for as coaches, if we are worried about that impacting our drill or the quality of our drill, we can enter a second ball. But it's as simple as that. We need to be working every time we train volleyball, we need to ensure it's starting with a live contact and ending with a live contact. And if those two basic principles can be entered into every single gym, I think regardless of the rules that we see at 15 years, 16 years, 17 years, I think that will impact how we develop as, as volleyball players throughout the country. So Jen, uh, looking back at all these athletes now from when you played club, what's the biggest difference that you see out there today compared to back when you were this age? I just think the actual size of this event, like there's so, it's like over 600 teams, which is, it was fantastic. Um, so having like a super nationals where all the age groups are together and there's, you know, these resources didn't exist when, when I was playing nationals. So I think that's just a huge difference. And also I just like on the senior national team, the, the speed of the play is also higher than I think when I was playing club. Um, so I love to see that. 
But yeah, I, I just think overall, it's great to see more athletes in general at nationals. And I know, Dave, we love to talk about when we should remove the liberal at 15 years. We, we, we love to talk about this, and I know liberals would love it, but liberal is also a position, right? And so let's respect it as a position, let's train it as a position. And so I, I do think there's, it, it's not as simple as just removing the liberal, because we love to talk about that. And I, I think we're, I go, one or the other, coming back to maybe my core values, I'm not going to freak out on the things I can't change, right? This is, this is not something we can control right now, so do the best that you can with what you have. And that's really what we try and do as coaches in the national team. We do what we can with what we have. If we can't change the rules, then we're going to do the best with what we have. And so that's the way I look at it. All right, well, I got one, one last question. It's, it's a tough one, but there are a lot of parents in this building. Any words of advice and, uh, to the parents on helping them uh, with their child's path to a higher level? I mean, I think it's just really important for parents to remember that everybody's pathway is totally different, and everybody's rate of development is totally different, and it's really easy. I do it. I have little kids. I sit there at the lacrosse and compare my kids to the other kids playing the cross. And I'm like, why is he doing that? Why can't he do that? And I'm like, wow, that's not helping him. That's not helping him at all. And his development is his development. His pathway is his pathway. And I think as parents, we need to remind ourselves, keep it in perspective. If your kid's going to get there, they're going to get there. And your job is just to make sure that the opportunities are available to them and to ensure that they're enjoying their sport. And as long as they're enjoying it, they're going to stay involved in it. And the development will happen at the rate that it's going to happen. Um, stop comparing. And as an athlete, like I think one of the biggest blessings in my career is that my mother knows nothing about volleyball. <laughs> and she's gonna hear that and be upset. Now she does. But you know, when I was growing up, like we weren't having conversations about volleyball specific things. Like, she, did you try hard? Did you try your best? Like. Did you have fun? Like those, and I, I know it sounds simple, but like those are the conversations like you should be having with your kid, in my opinion. Like, are they trying their best? Are they having fun? Because once you get too involved in the nitty gritty of the sport, like you're there to be their supporter. You're there to to help lift them up, to keep them accountable. But you're not their coach unless you're a double role, which is a whole other thing. But yeah, but like I would try to stay away from volleyball specific advice or whatever like just be there for your child and and tell them that they get a good job and listen to them bend when they need that but um yeah and the other thing i have like parents are crushing it like there's so many parents here like they travel from all over the amount of support is phenomenal i think that a lot of these kids should be extremely grateful for what their parents are doing for them and, and how much their parents invest in them and how much time the parents allocate to their own sports and their own interests. So that can't go unnoticed. But the other thing I would say to parents is, don't be afraid to say no to, there's like 50 million opportunities out there, and everyone will tell you that that's the opportunity that's gonna get you onto the national team. Um, really, think about that. Is it really the right opportunity for your athlete, for your, your daughter or your son at that time? It's okay to say no, and because everyone's pathway is gonna be a little bit different. What I don't wanna see is parents taking out loans or, or you know, putting their family in a difficult situation because they feel like that child can't miss out on that opportunity because that's going to impact their future. I can't think of one opportunity right now that's going to impact a child's future to play for Canada. I can't think of it. There's not, and we have athletes who maybe can't do junior national team or youth national team, they can't afford it, or they get invited for net. And you know what, it's, it's, it's not for me, it's not the way for, for my family. That kid can still play for Canada. There's, there's no reason that they can't. So I think for parents, it's okay to say no, too. Like, don't feel like every opportunity has to happen. So let's just uh, finish up by talking about the next uh, two to three months in your guys' schedule, and we'll work our way back until tonight. Six, so, I think it's like five months. Yeah, so what, the next five months. So what do you guys got going on this summer? I know that you guys are in Calgary uh, for the BNL, and that'll be, that'll be an awesome event that we hope we get a lot of people to. And then obviously your red and white match tonight at seven. Yeah. Uh, what's happening over the next we, five months? We've got a game tonight, uh, last game in Edmonton tonight. Uh, red and white, come and watch. It's uh, pretty good volleyball, so I think it's worth coming out. Um, we're in Edmonton until the 29th, and then we're flying to Louisiana for the first round of Volleyball Nations League. We got round one there. Uh, we're home in Richmond for three days before we're in the Philippines for round two of VNL, and then we're straight to Calgary for round three of VNL. And uh, 
as long as we do well at VNL, we have uh, July off, and then we're coming to the gym and start to prepare for World Championships. We're in France for a tournament there, and then we'll go straight into World Championships, and we'll be done around mid-October. So we are pretty much all systems go from here until mid-October, hopefully a bit of a break in July. Um, but yeah, honestly, it's a really exciting schedule, it's a really exciting um, summer, and we have such a great group of athletes and a really good group of staff. We have a huge staff, and I know people always talk to me, but we've got this amazing group of staff who are here every single day for these athletes, and I think we have such an um, amazing group of people that traveling is not it's really fun. I mean, there's definitely hard days, but like I think one of those things when you're trying to create a program is like surround yourself with good people. And I think kudos to Shannon because she's uh, created a really positive environment that people that are accountable and work hard and it's just a, it's a great place to be. It's a fun time. I mean, it's, it, traveling's a grind. No matter how you look at it, people always ask us what have you done or what have you seen. We have been to all kinds of places around the world. We have seen every gym, airport, and hotel. We have never seen any of the places we've ever traveled to. So traveling's a grind, but the thing is when you have um, a group of people like staff, athletes where you know you're gonna have bumps in the road, you're gonna have disagreements, you're gonna have things that you're gonna have to hold each other accountable for. But when you're surrounded with good people with good intentions, the outcome is always good. Yeah. And that's something we talk about a lot is intention and like why are we here? And and so when those tough moments happen, like if you always assume the best intentions of someone. So when a situation happens and it's not ideal, like just go back to that into our core values and things things work out. Uh, I think we're in great hands. Uh, I wish you guys the best of luck over the next five months. We'll see you in Calgary because I'm helping out with that BNL event. But uh, I know you are you got a busy schedule, so thanks for taking the time today. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. And don't forget to come out to the game tonight, 7 o'clock, uh, red and white match. And also follow the Canadian women's team at KNWBNT on Insta. And don't be afraid to cheer when you're there. Yes. Be loud.